Well, I think I might introduce this again. So welcome everyone to claim on this live stream again, and now you can actually hear us hopefully. So uh, just repeating everything I just said silently, uh, Ajin Kovila and I haven't been in the same space for about six months. So now we're together finally, and good to see you Ajahn again. You. And uh, basically we're at Abayagiri Monastery, which was one of the first Ajahn Shah branches in the West and in the US co-founded by uh, Longpore Pasana and Ajahn Amro. It's about two hours north of San Francisco, and it's where Ajahn Kovilo ordained, and I spent maybe a year and a half here as well. So we come back here a few days ago, we're heading back to Seattle tomorrow, but in the meantime, it's been really meaningful to touch back into this home. And um, it's a guiding star for all Clear Mountain might be at uh, one point. Uh, someone says Zoom is not work letting us enter. That's because it hasn't started yet. Uh, that'll start at 6.45. So for now, just here. And Zoom will be later. Ajahn, um, what's it like being back at Abayagiri? And why is it kind of a meaningful place for you? And what stands out coming back? Or stands out coming coming back here? Also, partway through the live stream, we'll be joined by Ajahn Chunda, hopefully the acting abbot at Abayagiri. So. Which will be great. Um, maybe in the next five minutes or so. Um, he's a great friend of, of both of ours. So uh, that'll be nice to have him. But just in the meantime, yeah, it's always nice to come back to Abayagiri. Um, I am at Dhammaram Buddhist University, which is just 20 minutes down the road. Um, so I'll come back here maybe every once every six weeks. And it's always a really good perspective from um, what I'm usually doing. I'm doing, doing a lot of reading, um, although I'm living in a monastic wing of a quiet dorm of a Buddhist university in a fairly small city, which all are like contributing, quieting factors, coming to the forest here is always just a huge, it, it really feels quite significant. Mm -hmm. I uh, will be driven here and then I get out of the car and I just listen, just listen and hear the wind or just hear the, you hear the silence in a way which is just, um, I think quite noticeable for anybody who uh, who visits or who's used to living with the reverberation of, of a city, just the hum of sirens or cars, just hmm. anywhere at any time. But here living up, I live in a hut, which is about a 30 minute, 35 minute walk up the hill, which has got a beautiful view of the valley and just, yeah, on mornings, which are free, just look out over the valley, have this huge perception of space and, you know, say, wake up at really early in the morning, two, 3 a.m. And the stillness, which is just pervading the valley is just, it makes you want to meditate. Uh, this is one of the qualities spoken about in the Mangala Sutta, Pati Rupa Desa Vasocha, living in places of suitable kinds mm. is one of the highest blessings. So I really, you can feel the blessingness of, uh, the blessedness of living in a place like this when you're here. Mm. So, yeah. How about you? Yeah. When, was, yeah. when was the last time you were you were here? Six or seven months ago. Okay. Yeah, but only briefly. Um, maybe eight eight months. But um, yeah, I have a similar reflection. I mean, my life is pretty quiet too, um, out in the outskirts of Seattle, and yet coming back to the forest, people routinely come back from a Abayagiri and talk about the stars. And I really find there's something about uh, places where there's the perception of space it, are really significant. And also just the, there's a certain aliveness, even in the suburbs that are pretty quiet, you know, they have a particular magic or something, but to come into an area where it's really kind of vibrant and humming. And I know that they're in Buddhist folklore there's sort of talked about these different nature spirits that sort of embody or uh, speak to this idea of the the aliveness of the natural world and the nagas which are these river spirits and just this quality of water flowing through a place and then the garuda who are these sort of birds they are roughly like the um, native american thunderbirds and i've always felt like abayagiri was a place of the garuda you know there's it's just these vast mountains and there's all these birds. Um, I know someone who came here after his mom died to kind of develop, uh, to, to give merit um, basically. And 
when he went to get her ashes from his, from his hut, it was just covered in starlings, just like completely. Um, and I've always felt like this place has that spirit of spaciousness and kind of, it's always, yeah, it's, it, I feel the same way as you do when, when you come here, it really feels like uh, you're stepping into this quiet place again, even if you've been in quiet, it's a different alive quality to it. So, yeah. It's interesting about the Garudas. I mean, I think we've had two different Thai Kruba Ajans, Ajan Blian and Lumpur Biak, mm. who've come and talked about, you know, people ask them, these are monks from Thailand of a, um, an older generation, Lumpur um, Ajan Blian has passed away, mm. but he visited here. And I think he talked about, um, you know, some of the, some of these spirits, you know, people ask um, teachers like this questions and mm. um, yeah, one of these teachers spoke about how there were nagas. So, mm. and we don't have any rivers on the property, but we do have a really nice stream that starts at a uh, little waterfall place. And um, yeah, it is kind of an enchanted little little forest here. And it's, and especially for people who haven't been here and especially um, kind of sacred valley. I mean, it's, you've got a Bayagiri, which is 250 acres. Uh, and right next to that is a Ukrainian Uniate Christian monastery. So that's a, a Roman Catholic monastery, but in the style of Ukrainian or Eastern Orthodox. So you've got these obelisks, um, but a really beautiful uh, Catholic monastery with um, yeah, pretty alive monastic community. And then a Thai monastery, um, KPY, Kipapanyo um, Monastery, right next door. So basically we're, we're protecting the area and you can see that in the wildlife. Mm -hmm. The deer are just so friendly. They're fearless. <laughs> Ajahn Chunda. Hello. We're joined by Ajahn Chunda, the acting abbot. He'll be sitting next to us in a second. We were just talking about the friendly deer. And actually just two days ago, Ajahn Sudhiro and I saw a fox here in the cloister. And uh, yeah, it was just the tamest fox I've ever seen in my life. It was just like a, a cat. Little house cat. Ajahn. Well, you got to play with it. <laughs> um, I did give it some oatmeal. <laughs> oh, he didn't. <laughs> That's all we had. <laughs> and uh, one thing that does come to mind as Ajahn Jun is sitting here is, you know, in addition to Longpur Plea and, and others coming to a Baigiri and speaking to it, don't worry about that, Ajahn. Um, there was one, I think, Qigong master who came and he said, uh, This place has will have few people, but many Buddhas. And I always thought that was a beautiful kind of phrasing of the ethic of the monasteries. It doesn't necessarily matter how many people come, but it's the depth of what it means to them. So, Ajahn, nice to see you. <laughs> this is uh, Ajahn Chunda. Yes. Ajahn, can I read your biography? For? If you must. Uh, <laughs> I don't must, but I, I will. I okay, go ahead. Good. It's go good. Ahead. So this is Ajahn Chunda, who was raised in a warm and loving family in the suburbs of northern Chicago. And feel free to add anything if there's extras. And he moved to California in 1996. His interest in Buddhism began in high school, continued in college, led him on a spiritual search to Asia, and eventually drew him towards Theravada meditation practices. It was not until he first came into contact with the monks of Abhayagiri, however, that he understood how monastic training could lead to a life of wisdom, peace, and profound satisfaction. Ajahn Chunda headed for Abhayagiri in late 2005 and after two years as an Anagarika and Salmonera, as the trainee and the novice, he ordained as a bhikkhu on May 22nd, 2008. Under Lumpur Pasano and Ajahn Amro, he trained at a Baigiri for eight and a half years. 2014, Ajahn Chunda moved to Tisarana Monastery in Canada to practice under the guidance of Lumpur Viradhamma. He departed for a more nomadic life in 2017, living in several Western monasteries, including Bodhivana and Damagiri in Australia, Chithurst in England, Santa Chitarama in Italy, before returning to Abhayagiri in early 2020. In 2021 and early 2022, Ajahn Chunda spent a year at Pacific Hermitage, which is actually, I think that was at least our first. Where we all met, streaming. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not didn't meet, but we're together. Yeah. yeah. And then since 2022, he has returned to Abhayagiri indefinitely, and he is the current acting abbot while Ajahn Yanako is in Thailand. So great to have you, Ajahn. Yeah. And uh, Malika from Brisbane saying hello to you. She says, remembers you having visited Dharma Geary. So. Hello, Malika, yep. <laughs> all right, good. I think it's trying to focus on all three of us, but that's all right, just be blurry. <laughs> yeah, I just came in from 
delivering uh, Ton Sampano and Ton Yasa to uh, the airport. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Max drove them while I was teaching at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. So it was nice I hadn't been back to the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery in probably like 12 years or something. So, and I, I'd, I'd never taught there. So I um, just went to, you know, with one of the senior monks. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was quite nice. And seeing some, you know, the, the group, we did like a hybrid Q and A and then, and then just had a quiet evening with um, some people who attended the puja and talked and that. And then this morning we, we stayed overnight and then this morning we dropped off Vajan Pasadiko to the airport and then went to go see Rabbi Mintz, uh, my who sister, is? who is my sister, my sister Rabbi Mintz. Um, who I like to call Sydney, and uh, she's in Sausalito with her partner and stepson, and her son was visiting. He's like twenty-seven now, mm -hmm. uh, Elijah. So yeah, it was a nice family gathering. On that note, Ajahn, um, yeah. you know, what have you? I know that you, you and your sister have navigated the fact that you both are religious professionals of a kind, a clergy of a kind. So what have you found to be the relevant discussions that have come out of that? Like what part of her faith overlaps with you? I mean, you grew up Jewish as well, obviously, um, you know, and. We, we don't, we don't talk too much. I mean, t today we, we had a bit of a deeper discussion, uh, which was, was more unusual. Um, and, uh, but we don't, we don't, we tend to not have like, like interreligious dialogue. <laughs> so Interfamily. Um, Interfamily. we just kind of, yeah, it's more like family dialogue. <laughs> um, and it's not, it's, and she's actually, we didn't uh, talk about, we haven't talked about it in a while, but she actually wanted to have, um, do like a podcast together. And that hasn't been done. So she brought that up with me. It would be great. I mean, maybe we could host the podcast and we could have like a yeah we could we could try to do that yeah so she i mean it was just interesting to hear about my when i was talking about my construction what was around building four cookies <laughs> four little huts <laughs> you know basically re revamping an entire block of san francisco uh, jim there's uh something i think called religious envy which is you see something in another tradition that you really wish was in yours mm. is there anything in the jewish tradition which you're like that's something we could learn from. I wish we had more of that in ours. Maybe not like a direct transfer, but like certain things that you think we could learn from. Um, that's a good question. Cause I mean, that would kind of bring up my past and kind of, but I mean, obviously the, the thing that's hard to answer around that is I mostly left cause I was dissatisfied with my, my sense of the religion, but it wasn't, it wasn't everything. I mean, there's, quite a, a very strong family bond um, that's brought up with Judaism that, um, and it's kind of like, there's, because it's, it's, it's often been a, a minority religion, then um, there's kind of been a, even when I, uh, I jokingly, the, the Onagark who drove me was Onagark and Max. And I said, oh, he's, I, and when he walked in, I said, oh, he's an MOT, <laughs> which means member of the tribe. And so his Max <laughs> has a Jewish background. And uh, so that there's that kind of feeling, uh, yeah, or kind of like a camaraderie or, uh, or family relationship. And uh, it's, I guess it's a little hard to describe, but I mean, like being Jewish, if you had somebody else talk about being Jewish in their past, it would be something that other people are like, yep, yep, that's exactly the same for me. Um, but I don't know, the humor, I appreciate the humor in Judaism and um, uh kind of the the sort of more like straight the the cultural elements that that are there just like very kind of straight and direct um almost to a fault <laughs> uh, things like that but uh one of the things that judaism is is very good with is sila so there's a lot of practice around sila there's certain things we would disagree with uh pretty strongly actually around certain elements but sila is still very strong uh, in Judaism and what's taught, and uh, and it, but it, it, there are some ways that it, it varies and would be and would be very 
different from uh, how the Buddha teaches about sila. Uh, but, but still there's that very strong connection with sila that's there, with that more moral sense of how to behave, how to, how to be a just and good human being. Have, have you seen, I think, a number of things that you highlighted um, in Jewish tradition um, being strong points, which I've also seen amongst friends growing up who are Jewish. But in terms of like, yeah, that strength of the family bond and that being, um, you know, having a, a lot of really wholesome and beautiful elements to it. And I'm curious if you've seen, you know, here at Abayagiri, we've got the, the kid room and you know, the kid's playroom. It's, it's kind of t- small, but um, have you seen either at Abayagiri or other Buddhist monasteries you've looked at like skillful ways of integrating families into monasteries? I mean, in Thailand, it's, mm. it's really integrated. The whole family will come to the monastery. Kids will offer, you know, food on alms round. Um, whereas in the West, most people come to Buddhism through meditation, which is not really a family. It's almost like you come to meditate to get away from your family. Um, but, you know, as we, like these modern Western monasteries evolve, you know, we have a lot of skillful abbots at the helm and um, curious what you've observed or what you think a good direction um, is for for this relationship? Well, Lumpur Pasano, he, um, he was often quite eager with uh, younger children in terms of like that. So he and, and Ajahn Jayasaro in particular saw that like, well, the younger somebody is that they're actually brought up with Buddhist values and um, they can understand mindfulness and meditation and things like that. They can be taught quite early on. Then that's really where you can, you know, bring the, 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 the religion, the, the, um, the philosophies of Buddhism into a person's life much more easily, you know, if they start young, whereas later in life, I mean, we often discover it, but it's, it's not like too late, but it's, it would be so much easier if, um, if like you, you had like, think about, you know, if you really mindfulness is now being taught in schools. And if that was just a very regular thing, um, just to teach the, the Eightfold Path, you know, or about the Four Noble Truths, or really try to figure out ways how we can use that with children, then um, it would be very helpful. So Lumpur always wanted to go on, you know, was always a big participant in um, the Spirit Rock family retreat and thought that that was extremely valuable. And he and Aj- Ajinamaro, Ajinamaro did that for many years, and then Lumpur t- took that over when Ajinamaro left. So that's been something he's emphasized a lot. And then I can see as well when, when family members come here, he's always kind of reaching out to the kids and asking them questions. Um, for us, we haven't had the opportunity to have like a, a lot of contact with families who are in more constant, you know, they have more constant presence here, but that's happened across the street with Greg and C and their son, Che, who um, they're deliberately, you know, sees Thai and, and um, they've deliberately moved just across the street to have that closeness to us. And so everybody in the monastery knows Che and, you know, we're all, he's kind of a part of our life and we talk with him and I think he feels very comfortable around all the, mm-hmm. all the monks, you know? And so it's, it, it would be, I think a lot nicer um, to have more of that, but it's, it's just kind of a rare, a rare thing, but I think it's something that, the monks are quite open to and because you know kids are are quite they're quite nice to relate to because they have an innocence about them they're not jaded they're not usually worried about you know the things that adults are in terms of their meditation they don't have so many hang-ups mm-hmm. you know um <laughs> there or, or like anxieties or, or things they're just kind of curious about life so um i mean it'd be nice if there was more of that here um but we just we just haven't had so much of it and Ajahn, the, um, I remember going, your mother came and visited, I think we were when we were in Australia together. And I remember asking her or you about the Jewish view on the afterlife. And you talked about how, you know, in Judaism, there's this focus on sila. Um, and it seems like in a lot of, you know, religious structures, there's sort of the theolo- you know, uh, theological view and that kind of uh, has an emergent quality of sila. And it almost seemed like from talking to you both then that it's almost like sila and community are really primary in, in or at least held up a lot higher in Judaism. And then, um, you know, at least alongside or equal to kind of the sort of 
views on say the afterlife or transcendence, but I'm curious, are there resonances between, I don't really know the view that Judaism has on like awakening or afterlife and do any of those resonate with, with Buddhism or? Well, you'd have to ask my sister. I mean, there's also something called the, the Kabbalah and that's a, that's more of these sort of um, teachings that do resonate more, but I never studied them when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I don't know a lot about them, but yeah, they do actually talk about, I, I believe uh, they talk about past lives and, and, and rebirth and um, there's all kinds of uh, maybe even heavenly realms. I can't remember, but, but for the most part, the way I was taught about Judaism was not that mm. it was like, what happens after you die? It was like, well, nothing. <laughs> um, so that might be an incorrect view, but um, there wasn't much for me to go on. Um, so anyway, that, that was something that, uh, I haven't talked too much to, you know, with my sister about that. It'd be an interesting topic of discussion, but she, yeah, I mean, you're bringing up a lot of points that she kind of, we could probably talk about if she ever wants to start this podcast, but, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. About that. So yeah, I, unfortunately I didn't, I think that was part of the reason that I became, you know, I, I became interested in Buddhism and then eventually became a monk was because I lost an interest in Judaism, but maybe perhaps I wasn't explained thoroughly um, or, you know, about the religion, but I, I did grow up with it and went to, you know, Sunday school and had a bar mitzvah and all of those things. But still without, even with that, I, I don't think I had a, a very thorough training in it. Um, so. Thank you. Yeah. With regards to your more like recent history, you know, mm -hmm. being for the last six months you've been acting abbot of Abai Giri. and mm -hmm. I'm curious um, if you've had any insights from taking on from that shift in role and also I mean I think primarily people who watch or listen to our YouTube or our, uh, our podcasts are our lay people are not monastics but I wonder if there are any kind of crossovers like the insights that you've had from taking on this extra level of responsibility or this different type of responsibility mm -hmm. if that bleeds in or if it has equivalence in lay life as you can imagine it or as you lived it? Um, yeah, well, I think before I, Ajahn Yannicko left in December, I was, I was helping out with a lot of the decision-making and administration here with him and more rested with him on like sort of a final decision or something. And he consulted me and we talked a lot. Um, and so a couple of things there was, uh, I would say now, uh, I know his pain, <laughs> but, but more so it's like, yeah, when, when you, when you're, when there's nobody else really to turn to, to make certain decisions and you can ask people questions, but ultimately you have to decide something. It's, it's not very easy. And it, it, it comes with a, you know, the, there's, there's a requirement of, of trying to balance like, well, what's the right thing to do here and figuring it out. And then also being willing to make mistakes around that because there, there are plenty of mistakes that are made and that I've made uh, through this time. Um, but I, one of the things that I would say I've, I've learned a lot about is that how much my expectations are for something to work out or how much I plan it um, is in, in direct proportion to how much I'm going to suffer. So like I can plan something or I can hope that something's going to go a particular way, but if I'm expecting it to all be, you know, to work out and for me to be happy and, and for that's, that's the actual end goal is like, yeah, I will be happy when it, my plan works out. That's just a recipe for, you know, pretty much a lot of dukkha. So I think for me that um, having more of a, a, a closer relationship to my, my own propensity to think that something's going to work out in the way that I plan it doesn't mean you don't plan, but if I, you know, if I, I'm still willing to plan things, but to just, just to know, well, it could all fall apart and it's absolutely not going to turn out the way that I, mm -hmm. I expected it to, or probably wanted it to. And to kind of keep reminding myself of that over and over again, you know, we have these, this sense of Anicca and this teaching about Anicca, but unless we're able to confront it and, and work with it and, and, and use it as a reflection, then it, it doesn't, it can end up, you know, causing us kind of that, well, why did it work out that way? You know, well, of course, because, you know, we're in samsara and that's how it's supposed to work. It's like, um, you know, the, when the Buddha image came, um, 
I, the, the very large green Buddha image that came, it was this incredible image. And I was the first person to open the box. And, and while I was opening the box, I was like, I know it's going to be broken. I, be broken. <laughs> I didn't want it to be, yeah. but I was like, yeah, like it's going to be broken. And, and I opened it and I was like, it's broken. <laughs> <laughs> I just announced it. Was, like, was anybody and, else around? Or was it yeah, just, like, everybody was around. They were all around, but I was the one opening it. How badly you know. was it broken? It was badly broken. It was one of these I mean, things, yeah. One yeah, it was one of the flames, mm -hmm. the shoulders, plus the ears, points on the ears. But it was such an incredible piece. It was like any kind of brokenness around that. It was like, oh, there was a lot of pieces that were, yeah. Anyway, the point was, is like funny that even though I kind of was expecting that or working through that, I was really disappointed and as most people would be. But I couldn't let that disappointment go. It wasn't just like something that uh, I felt was okay and there was like it's just like kind of has eaten away you know like this kind of like oh such a shame you know beautiful <laughs> image and because i just have such a perfectionist bend and so that's that's what one really needs to be careful with and i need to be careful with because what what was said later about that situation was no broken no buddhism mm -hmm. you know so if like if you expect that something's not going to be broken or, or not going to be impermanent, then there's the Buddha was just wasting his time. He's wasting his teachings because that's what he taught. That was the essence of his teachings. You know, everything that arises falls away. There is this Anicca element. There's the Dukkha that comes, you know, with that fact. And then we keep confusing it with like me and my statue. And you should, I mean, I never thought about it that way, but it was more like there's some identity with that, that it should have worked out. Or even that I was like, I mean, I had nothing to do with it. It was Ajahn Yanako who actually orchestrated that um, with a, a layman who, um, who had many uh, people who, who supported the, bringing that image here. But it was just a very personal kind of thing. And so uh, in um, about eight or nine days, a, a stonemason is actually coming to repair the image. <laughs> oh, eight or nine days from now. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he's, uh, that's his specialty is masonry repair, uh, especially like things like artworks and statues and other things so um so i haven't let it go but but he said to me as i was talking with him he said uh you know are you going to be okay with 80 percent and I, you know i was like uh and then i realized when he said that he's you know he was he was giving me a reality check he's like that's all you're going to get he's like you know you will never be able to restore you know something that was perfect or, or didn't have any problems you can't you can't make it perfect again it just doesn't work that way and um it's like our bodies it's the same thing with our bodies you know we we as we age and we sicken it's the same thing like we we might think like oh i'm gonna get in shape and i'm gonna get better and we're just we're not gonna get younger you know we're not gonna if we if we can try you know people try to remove the wrinkles they can do it but they just come back i it reminds me uh it's a good analogy and if people have other questions please type them into the chat um but i remember you were the first monk i i met at abayagiri i think i came when i was uh off of a road trip and i just read like the hunger games and listened to top 40 radio <laughs> for like a week straight driving down the coast and i came here and told you i was interested in like doing a self-retreat and you're like you should be a monk or something like that and you gave me a packet <laughs> like a huge packet and it's like wow um <laughs> but uh, it was a packet on ordaining. <laughs> it's like, all right. so this, it might have been a little guy, too enthusiastic. Yeah, it, it those works. Days. It works. Yeah, I guess um, it worked for you. But, but, uh, yeah. I don't know how many. Like, I don't know how many miss, miss, you know, <laughs> people driven away. But hopefully, not many. You yeah. were a great, a great welcome. But you were laid up at the time with your feet, and mm -hmm. uh, I remember, you know, it, it's one thing to talk about being okay with the broken image. And yet when you really have to confront something not working out and the 80% of life, like it, it is a different, I mean, it really is something you have to work with. And I remember you talking about this moment when your feet weren't getting better and you kind of had this like change of heart where you realized, you know, that this couldn't be the one thing that defined your holy life or something. And would you talk about that moment? Cause it, it was significant. I felt like, and you've dealt with a lot of injuries, you know? Yeah, I think, I mean, they're, they're definitely better than they were at that time. 
and so, you know, I ended up injuring them again after they got quite better. <laughs> so, and that, you know, that was disappointing. It was the same kind of disappointment, but um, it was, it, there was, so there was a bit of that dropping away even the second time that I injured them. Um, but the, yeah, I think, I think what was going on a lot was just so much dukkha and struggle around, around like believing that, you know, this can be fixed, this will get better. And, and it was, it was so strong and based on so much ignorance that when it just was showing me over and over again, that that wasn't going to be the case, um, you know, and, and I had surgery, uh, you know, twice, but the, the first time it, you know, it just kept like, it just kept kind of showing me just, this is not going to work out the way you want it. And so there was, a, I, I was forced into it. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't a, uh, a sense of like really being able to, to kind of keep trying to convince myself. It was almost like trying to lie to myself or something. Mm. And so that, that really just came about through um, a sense of, of like realizing like there's so much dukkha holding on to the body and, and wanting it to, to, to like go backwards, you know, to, to be perfect again. Uh, and it was never perfect, but to be like the way it was and that, that I just kind of more, I think, recognized the dukkha that I was holding onto and that, you know, the, or not holding onto the dukkha, but so much attachment to the body that, that eventually, um, it just was like, it, I, there wasn't any really choice, but to recognize that. Wasn't there a moment when you like looked in the mirror and were like, you liar or something? Like yeah, I, I, I remember that now. Yeah, it was just something where like, this is, this is ridiculous. This isn't gonna, this isn't going anywhere. Um, and then, and then, cause I, cause you know, it's like, we pay attention to our thoughts so much and they just, they're just like, for me, they were just saying the same thing over and over and over again. And it was a lie. It wasn't true. Like, it's like, no, it's going to work. It's going to get better. And so when that finally hit, then I was able to overcome it through that, through that, con you know, confronting the facts really like this isn't this isn't how it is and then also like recognizing it's not helping hmm. you know it's just not helping to keep this attachment up um but it was there was a lot of recalcitrant thinking and you know just like i think for most people like somebody who's diagnosed with cancer or something like that it's like i'm gonna fight this to the death you know and uh and you know it's it can be you know people can sometimes do that but then there can be a lot of unskillfulness with um how we attach to the body and um i think there's a way to do it more skillfully that we try to work with our health but we don't do it with so much attachment or expectation because otherwise we're going to suffer like i did for many years and and i guess now just to say now it's just like i just deal with it as it comes up sometimes it's not a problem at all and other days it is. And, and I just kind of like, well, that's how it is. And there's a little bit of that whining voice that comes up like, why? But then it's just like, well, it is the way it is. There, there's not a, there, you know, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. And so that what, what comes up is sometimes like this strange expectation. No, but it, you could be doing better. And, um, and so it's like just dropping that because it's painful. In the moment. And it is, like you said, it's a lie. It's not true. It's like just what, however I'm doing is how I'm doing. So, yeah. You were definitely uh, a really good example of, I mean, you went through, it was like a number of years that you were, you know, your um, body was giving you all these troubles, but then just sticking out, continuing to like live here to buy Geary. And I mean, I know quite a few other monks who have some kind of like health thing come up and then they just leave the robes because um, yeah, they don't, they feel like they're a burden to the community, but um, yeah, I feel like it was, it was great. I'm so glad that you, yeah, uh, it was a good example for monks. You you weren't that old. You were probably in your late thirties or maybe early forties when that was, it was, uh, yeah, like late thirties, mid, mid to late thirties. Yeah. Yeah. Just sticking out. Yeah. So I do. Yeah. Can we ask some questions? Sure. sure. We have uh, at least one person who's watching uh, actually knows your sister loves Rabbi Mintz. It's Deborah, Deborah R. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And we have a question here um, 
about children. So shifting back to the family question, mm -hmm. do you ever teach children meditation? And at what age do you think it's appropriate to start? Uh, six months. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, I, actually it's, it's not, I don't know if you can say there's not an age like, like, you can't teach obviously a six month old how to, to meditate, but you could, you know, let's say just, just being quiet uh, around uh, a toddler um, trying to imbibe the, that sense of, of watching one's own mind can be a teaching. So, I mean, in, in a way that that's helpful for, for younger, um, very young children to be able to witness a parent that isn't like necessarily reacting um, and to, you know, to their own emotional tendencies that might be very strong, you know, to, cause it's so challenging to raise children. So, you know, some parents can be, um, examples to their kids so that, um, the kids sort of gain in, in skillfulness in what they're doing. Um, meditation is, is obviously something that takes a while. I know that one of, um, one of, our friends, Alex has two boys. Might even have, I think there's just two. Um, and he says one of them sits, sits with him. Um, and he'll be like, you know, I think he's like four or five or something. He just like his, his hit hits cause his, his dad sits. So he wants to do what his dad does. So he sits there and they both, he's kind of tried to teach him a little bit, I think. And then every now and again, he'll like look down and, you know, look at him and he's, <laughs> I don't know what is I imagine a little kid just sitting there like, and he's saying what what is going on in his head it must be so interesting in there. um but yeah I think I think basically um maybe not formal meditation at such an early age of like one or two or three but but communicating around like getting to know their own bodies you know how do you know when you're when you're you know you're hungry hmm. You know, because they might they might start to get cranky and ornery, and then teaching them to recognize, like, okay, like before you start responding out of that crankiness or hungriness, like, are you hungry? You know, teaching them to ask that of themselves. You know, or are you sleepy? You know, is there something going on so that they start to training to know their own bodies and what their own internal experiences are, so that emotionally they become intelligent. So you can't teach emotional intelligence, but it has to be done, I think, quite creatively with kids and. Um, I saw a father once uh, with his daughter at uh, Bodhiwana Monastery where she was having a temper tantrum and, and then he just started having a temper tantrum with her and he would, he mimicked everything that she was doing until she, she was able to recognize kind of the ridiculousness of the situation because she wasn't, she wasn't getting the pull from her father around like, I'm going to, you know, take him into this. And he was just this mirror for her. And then she perfectly like kind of calmed down, started giggling and was happy. And then, and so it's, there's all kinds of ways I think to teach kids, but um, it's, it, it does take like a language, you know, like, like there's some parents who speak a, uh, another language other than English. Sometimes the partner speaks fluent English and the other partner speaks fluent English, but also another language. And they might make the effort to not speak English to their child and only speak that other language because they really want to, that child to learn. That's quite difficult, you know, because a child has to, has to um, speak English with one parent and then respond to the other in a different language. And then that parent only responds in that language, won't speak in English. And there's a, probably a little bit of a uh, pain for the child because they just want to use that language that's common, you know, to the, three, to the two of his parents. So that, but by making that extra effort, you know, just like with Dhamma practice, if you can try to make an extra effort into like, okay, this is what's really important, then it, it can pay off. You know, a child can actually grow up with understanding mindfulness, with understanding like their own emotions, um, their own dukkha, and possibly even how to alleviate their own dukkha over time. It's interesting. I know they've done studies that in bilingual countries, uh, dementia rates are significantly lower. And this idea mm -hmm. of like Dhamma as a second language that you can just kind of if you use the words or have the symbols around or just even the act of meditating, like it is this just other language, you don't need to explicitly like give lessons in it necessarily, but you see it in Thailand, like the concepts of Anicca or giving, they're just embedded in the culture in this whole other way. So yeah. Have you considered mimicking the temper tantrums of 
of uh, <laughs> recalcitrant community Monks. members. <laughs> uh, I did that once. I did that once. And it, it, it was an interesting experiment. Uh, that the monastics it, had temper tantrums all that long. It wasn't a temper tantrum, but it was it was a it was a situation where I thought somebody was acting unskillfully and saying something unskillfully, mm -hmm. and so I mimicked exactly what was going on, you know, to them, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was a difficult conversation. It was quite uh, painful, but it I, it had the effect mm -hmm. um, that 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 monk seemed to have understood, like that he had misstepped in how he was speaking and, and what he was saying. Um, and I was just trying to illustrate it because sometimes you just can't recognize something without somebody else actually kind of really being a mirror for you saying like, this is what you're saying. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just, just actually repeating exactly what he's saying. Um, so yeah, there can be interesting <laughs> ways to try different teachings out. But I don't do that too in, uh, very often. I think the time just flew by. That's yeah. basically our time. Okay. Um, it was great talking with you. I hope we have many more talks and it could be fun actually to have kind of a, cause we've already got the platforms. We would invite your have. sister and you on. Yeah. It's a weekend right, four I'll people. We can arrange it to be a zoom or something like that. So, okay. Yeah. That'd be fascinating. So we had a couple of people yeah, talking about how they would love to see that conversation. So, okay. Yeah. She's a very wise being. She's been a rabbi for much longer than I was a monk. I've been a monk. Um, I think it's uh maybe 30 yeah 30 something years now so if i'm right yeah we're almost yeah anyway yeah i we, we could try something like that Roger, we really appreciate your friendship your guidance and and everything Absolutely. so thank you so much for receiving us and for all you do yeah and uh just want to mention that uh, i have a lot of faith in these two monks and i'm happy that they're um uh, starting a monastery together so um and uh, yeah, I, I really have a lot of mudita for for your um, for all of the people who uh, you're able to um, help, and for those who are also able to help you. So I'm very happy with the Clear Mountain Monastery community, and um, and just that uh, it's kind of it's it's really like blossomed and and bloomed, and and there's a lot of happiness and goodness that's coming out of it. So. Yeah. Yeah. graduate soon it's <laughs> <laughs> a good idea uh, well I think we're going to uh, shift over to Zoom now uh, Ajahn Nisibo and Ajahn Chinda and we'll all be going to uh, evening chanting here so mm. um, we're actually going to have Mary has volunteered to um, host the Zoom session so people can go over there we've got the link in the chat and just and if it didn't show up in the chat, go to uh, our Clear Mountain Monastery website page and just scroll down halfway to the Wednesday evening event and you should find the Zoom link there. Continue, Ajahn. Yeah. And Ajahn Isbo and I will be live in Seattle. We're going back tomorrow. So we'll, we can see people in person at St. Mark's on Saturday and then we'll be back for another uh, Wednesday evening live stream next week, possibly with Ajahn Pasano, who's going to be visiting us. So everyone has a good week. Thank you again, Ajahn. Absolutely. Okay. I'll do it.